introduce our next speakers, okay? Uh, they participate in the North American Ice Fishing Circuit and are pretty good ice fishermen. Warren and Jim. Anybody else come in behind you or are you the last guy? There's a couple. All right. We'll just do a slow introduction. That way the guys that are coming in late with their coffee don't miss anything. It's only Bubba Lou. But I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. Today. 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 Last year you guys came. Some of you guys came. And girls. And ladies. <laughs> thank you. But uh, this last year, you guys uh, kicked us off. We had our best year. We went to the championship. One week from now, we leave to Minneapolis for a week in a championship. You guys gave us our best send-off. We were 16th after day one. We finished 25th out of the whole contest. We went to Indiana. We got our first wood. We placed third. We finally got it after 15 years. I've only been fishing as far in the last four or five seasons, so we've come a long way in a short amount of time as a team. We placed eighth in the contest, and we go off on eighth place. But then, during the season before, Jim catches big fish, and we win up 55. So that was pretty cool. So we're, we're doing good things, and we hope to build on what we've learned on the ice and what we've learned in these magazines. So the team of the year eighth place was pretty cool. So going into day one on the lax, we'll be eighth on the takeoff. So that's pretty cool stuff. We fished last year there, so we have a little uh, you know, knowledge of the body of water. We're not going in cold, so we had to step up on some of the guys. Not only do we know the lake a little bit, but we also are really high on the release. So that's pretty good stuff. But uh, I go by the nickname the Crappie Professor. He goes by the nickname Blue Ice CPA. So if you see those names on the threads and the popular boards, these are the two guys that are contributing. Uh, I run a guide service out on Chavanaugh Lake and Evergreen Lake, which is down near central Illinois. I primarily hunt crappie. Uh, during the spring, we do some walleye, some bass. You want me to slide over? <laughs> Better? Yeah, yeah, the other corner. Yeah, the other side. Side. <laughs> Perfect. Set off to the corner. All right. All right. Yeah, just another day in the life. Um, so if you guys are interested in targeting one of those bodies of water, come see me after the presentation. I have some brochures with some prices on it. I guide out of a 24-foot pontoon boat, which is pretty cool. So a lot of fishing clubs hook up and come on out on that. That's a pretty good time. So we can take larger groups, say five, six guys. And then I have another gentleman that works with me that if it's more than that, we can, you know, between the two boats, get everybody out there. So it's basically tailgating out on the, on the boat. It's pretty good. Yeah, it is a good time. But today's uh, presentation is going to be on ice fishing. And when I get out to the lake and we have one of those mornings, I mean, it's all good after that. I mean, just getting out there, the solitude and, and hunting up fish. Today we're going to talk a little bit about bluegill and crappie, the primary uh, species that we target during the tournament, uh, the tournament trail. Uh, got some personal bests last year. It isn't one of the species sought after for points, but I got a personal best walleye using some of the plastic tails that we got turned on to who are now sponsored by. So give those a look. If you're into using finesse plastics, it's one of the best tails out there as far as the wedgie goes. Um, we don't use a lot of live bait anymore. It's all these finesse plastics. So it's pretty pretty good stuff. If you can go out there and have confidence to work these baits and pull on a ton of fish. Uh, when we talk about augers, remind me to tell you about that red tape on my finger. There's some safety that you have to mind while you're handling these things. But uh, we do pretty good. We do a lot of, I, I don't guide out on the ice because the lakes that I uh, guide during the open water period, I'd have to drag everything out by hand. So that would get uh, quite hard for me to pull, you know, enough shanties out there for four or five guys. So I don't guide out on the ice. I wish I could. They just don't allow you to have a snowmobile or a quad on any of those bodies of water. Um, but it, once you figure it out, once you learn the science of the fish, where they should be, we attack it the same way on the ice that we do in open water. We're trying areas that they normally show up in, and it's the same rule of thumb that after 20 minutes in open water, if we don't catch fish, we might see them that they're down there, but you can't turn in an inactive fish active. So we hunt them. We just keep going and going and going, and eventually you do find an active pot of fish, and it's real easy to get that many crappie. Sometimes out of one hole, sometimes by the end of the day you'll have that. The first thing we want to talk about is safety, especially this time of the year. First ice and last ice, you always find conscious that that ice is really never safe. 
So you just want to be aware of it. And there are some things that we pack or bring along almost on every trip to make sure that if something does happen, Warren has gone through, uh, he was checking ice on Lake Max in Kentucky last year. We had a very mild winter. So the tournament director actually asked him to go to the bad water and see the boundaries if we can you know, get certain areas on the lake. And he went through, but he had the suit. He was toasty warm. In fact, the other guys that came to help get him out and get his gear out were worse off than he was. And he was the one that was in the water. You know, them getting wet, handling him getting them out because of what they were wearing. And he'll discuss that a little later. But he was, he was fine. You know, just getting back out onto the ice was probably the worst part about it. Um, but we wear the ice picks around our neck, so if you were to go through, I've never gone through, and out of the close to 30 years that I've been ice fishing, I want to continue to say that. I don't want to go through. From everyone that has gone through, the way that they talked about it, it's not a pleasant experience, so I don't want to experience it at all. Uh, during some of the early or late uh, conditions, you want to have some boot grippers so you don't slide. As we get older, I'm bearing down on 52, you take a Brody out on the ice, you know, you're not walking away from some of those injuries as quick as you used to. So I don't want to fall down. I wear boot grippers. I think the uh, Catulas is a brand that we really have a lot of success with. Micro Spike. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's several uh, uh, different manufacturers out there. Anything is better than nothing. You know? So be conscious of that. If there's no snow on there, and, and in some of the early ice, we haven't had a snowfall. So it's, it's, once the water comes up from augering a hole, it's pretty slippery. So you want to be careful out there. We carry a throwable device. Um, he's got it buried here. It's basically a, a boat cushion with uh, about 30, 40 foot of angle rope tied to it. You don't want to go walking towards the person that's in the water. You want to be able to throw something to them, something large that they can grab. Uh, from what I hear from the guys that have gone through, they, they lose their uh, fingers and dexterity really quick. So they can't just grab a rope. It's easier to hug that cushion or slip an arm through one of the loops, and then you stand away from him where you're safe and get him back out on the ice. We dress in layers. Warren will be covering the uh, new clothing that's out there. I, I'm never told. In fact, we rarely will sit in a shanty and fish, even when it's raining out there. And it's just, the, with the layering system and the new clothing that's out there, you, you're fine as long as you're active. The only time I'll go in a shanty is when we're just going to sit over fish for the whole day. Uh, if I'm drilling a lot of holes, if I'm checking holes and, and you know catching fish out of a bunch of these ice trolling runs that we make, I generate enough heat with that suit on, I don't need to go into shanty. But if I'm going to hunker down and just sit on a weed bed, yeah, I might get in a, a shanty to get out of the wind because I'm not generating any heat by the inactivity. And uh, bring a friend when you go out there. There's a lot of times I'll go out to local forest preserves and I'll call one of the old retired guys from the various clubs that I belong to. Just have a guy out there in case you do get in trouble. You have somebody that can call for help. And the other thing is if I'm catching more fish than him, I want to have bragging rights. You know, if you're catching big fish and you got no one to show them to, what good is that, you know? So. But if you're in a condition like this, this is late ice. The two guys that were standing near a hole, the water was actually filtering through the ice. That's a bad condition. You don't want to spread out or go home. That's not a good situation to be in. They walked away from the hole and you can see, you know, that water went right back through the ice. That's what they call honeycomb ice. That's a bad condition. Uh, you know, we, we left soon after we saw what was going on out there. We're going to shorten your learning curve today. We're going to touch on each one of the points, uh, the shanty or new suits, the augers, the depth finders, rods and tackle that are available, and the GPS and mapping that we use. Now, you don't have to have all the stuff that we've had. It's taken years to accumulate. Well, maybe Warren, it's a little quicker. Um, but if you guys that know Warren, you know, he's not afraid to spend that money and get the newest, greatest stuff. And we should call him Professor. Uh, Professor Gadget, because he seems to have that new stuff as soon as it comes out. Me, I'm a little behind the curve there. But hopefully by the end of today's session, we're going to get you from where you are, either a beginner or intermediate, and see the stuff that's available for those advanced anglers or the guys that are fishing the, uh, the pro tour. And we'll touch on shanties. If, if you're in the market for a shanty, the best advice I can give you right now is get out to Cabela's or get out to Bass Pro. Get inside the shanty that you're thinking about purchasing. See it. it, it actually, the footprint of it is going to be big enough for you and your equipment to, to pull it around the lake. How easy is it to set up and take down? And remember, when you're going to be doing all that, you're going to have a lot more clothes on. So some of the collapsible shanties aren't as quick to erect when you're out there. 
You can have gloves on or you can have it, you know, your suit on. Some of that stuff doesn't operate real well with gloves on. So just get in the shanty, check them out, see how long, time yourself. You know, if you're concerned about going out where it's real windy and cold and it's going to take you 10, 15 minutes to set one of these things up, you know, time is of essence. You don't want to get cold. You want to have something. I like the flip over type from plant. When you get in it, you pull it over you, you're done. You're taking your gloves off, you're firing up the, the depth finder, whichever one you have, and you're ready to go to work. Uh, I, I don't want to waste a lot of time setting something up or taking it down. When I take my wife and kids out, same thing. I have a three man, it's from Clam. The buttons are very easy to operate with gloves on. I can get them into the shanty, get that heater fired up you know, real quick. The last thing I want to have is my wife or kids feeling cold because they're not going to want to go back out. Um, do they have windows or vents in it? Sometimes you get heated up from the walk out to where you're going to fish. You generate a lot of heat. You want to be able to take off you know, a layer or so. You want to be able to vent that. And, and some of the sun, the, the fabric, it, it gathers a lot of solar energy. So just having that thing without a heater sometimes is enough to keep you, you know, warm enough to operate inside the shanty. They have black, uh, Prego has a lot of black products, even the blue uh, from Clam, it gathers enough heat that you, sometimes you don't need a lantern or uh, a heater to keep the shanty comfortable. Uh, and the other thing is if you do get some of those wet snows that we seem to get in our area, you, don't, you, know, you get that slushy stuff that's dropping on you, being in a shanty, you can stay out there a little bit longer and catch a lot more fish than uh, getting soaked. And then a lot of them have chairs. As we get older, you know, that lower back starts to twinge a little bit as you're out there for three, four, six hours. Having that seat, you know, a little something more comfortable to sit on than just a bucket is pretty cool. Uh, and when we do go out there in groups, we're still together. We're just independent of one another. You're not sitting right on each other's, you know, spots. You know, when one guy calls you up and says, hey, I'm doing good over here, four feet of water, you know, the bluegill are pretty nice size, you know, then you can pack your stuff up. You know, being mobile, just go right closer to what he's on or look at your map, find an area that lays out the same way and go check out that area. You want to be able to pack up real quick, move, set back up, and, and be on fish. So mobility is the key when you're thinking about a shanty. If it's very time-consuming or a hassle to collapse it and move, you're not going to want to move. But if you think about that when, when you're purchasing one, how easy is this thing going to be? Or, or is there enough room to take all my tackle out there? And when you start calculating what you're bringing out, if it's a depth finder, a camera, a hand auger, or a power auger, my tackle, a bucket to bring fish home in, it starts to occupy a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can fish out of just a sled, a kid's sled, or some of those otter sleds that have a little bit taller size to keep things from falling in and out of it. And then there's days where you want to take the shanty. So just keep, it's a great time to go out there and check out what they got on display and see how you're going to lay out. I mean, pull the buckets off the shelf. You know you got three buckets worth of gear? Lay the buckets in that sled. See how it looks. Is there going to be enough room? And then if you're going to bring a cooler with whatever you want to drink or eat while you're out there, make sure you, you, know, you have that mobility and that room for all that stuff. And the other thing about the shanty is don't keep your spot secret. When you get on the areas like Nielsen's Channels, that motion is real easy to see from a long way off. So sometimes to stay key or some of the tournaments that we fish in, you're trying to be a little more secret about what you're doing or how much you're catching. A shanty will help you keep that secret. New suits, I'll let Warren talk about the materials that are out there for, uh, for new suits. What uh, you need to understand, your old Carhartts or the jeans that you have, when that gets wet, denim, you get 5% insulation, cold. When you do scouts on the ice, you bring your sister's jeans, because your mother's jeans and your dad's jeans, and we're gonna change you every half hour. That'll keep you warm. If you had some intelligent parents, they said wool. <laughs> wool keeps you about 50% warm when wet, but it was awfully itchy and you had to deal with that. But 50s, 10 times better than that. And then somehow through the space program, they created fleece, polar fleece, shredded uh, pop bottles and what, they recycle it, comes in 100 weight, 200 weight, 300 weight, 400 weight. The other thing uh, they created was polyester. So Under Armour is probably the biggest company that created a whole series of these heat gear, cold 
gold gear, mint metal gear. What this material does, it gets your sweat to get away from your body. So it keeps you dry. This material, the polar fleece layer, gets your sweat then ventilated. The soups that we have are phenomenal. Uh, when Jim first started with me, he's a construction worker, he had his car hearts. <laughs> and he did that for a year, and then we got lucky, one of our buddies had a soup that would sell them, and he's been trying it, and, and uh, it's so light. This one is a Mustang survival soup. They make, this is made out of Canada. They've had so many snowmobilers go in to those rivers and not come back. So they've created a, uh, it's not a survival suit, but it'll, it'll float. So this is what I had on at Max and Tussie. We were following ice and I should have, light should have gone on because there was a parking lot with some going down there. So you had water going into an area. Soon as I follow the guy, I go in, he turns around, he goes in. He was, uh, in better shape. He had these, I didn't have these. But I'm in there, bouncing, I'm floating, life is good, I'm cold, but then I'm generating heat, my stuff's staying warm. He didn't have, he had uh, denim on, so he was getting cold, but he got out right away, and uh, I had a uh, rope and throw, throw thing, so he got on his butt, <laughs> After watching me try to get my hand up on the ice, my leg up on the ice, but my belly, being a grappling hook, wouldn't let me get out. So if I was by myself, I would have been there. Uh, that, that wouldn't have been a good thing. He then throws the rope. He can't pull. I said, sit down, sit down your butt, get your feet in, and pull me out. And, and, and we did. Last year, we lost one of the best guides, Jim Hudson, up at the Superior. And he is one of the uh, former police officer. He, he was on an ice rescue team. There's a product called Nebulous. It's a package. It goes for uh, $475. It fits about like this. It blows up into a three-man life boat that will float an ATV. And these guys have them all on their ATVs, but uh, he went out with a bunch of guys the next week and he didn't have his float suit on, he didn't have his nebulous, and he, he decided to go ex explore another area. He went out there, went in, his partner went in, his partner had a float suit, got out, but could not get him out when he went for help. He was then drowned because when you're, if you're in your gray suit and you're gaining water after after two, three, four minutes, the cold. So you you, you just want to be smart to have. If you're going to go into new areas, make sure you put a nebulous on your ATV or a flotation thing like they have on the Madison chain, and you want your ice picks and you want your rope for your buddies to get you out. Um, there's a uh, like, like I said, the layering system, the first layer in the system now is your, your polyester. So your wicker, under armor. Your under armor. Wick away your sweat. Then uh, decide on what kind of day it is. Is it 100 weight, 200 weight, or 300 weight that you'll put on? And then the uh, Gore-Tex jacket is out. But you want to remember, you don't want to sweat. <laughs> so you want to be able to vent if you start to sweat. Because sometimes you, you're pretty, you did everything right, you're warm, but now you're getting too warm. So we start lowering the zippers and, and making sure we're, we're not overheating. Uh, a point I want to make, the new suits that are out there, if you're looking for a price break, should I get the new suit or should I get a shanty? Because basically that's, when I first looked at them, I thought, that's a lot of money. Now that suit is almost as much as a shanty. But when I purchased the suit with all the pockets that are on it and as warm as I am when I'm wearing it, I no longer needed the shanty. So the point I'm trying to make is you can purchase a suit and pretty much get away from having a shanty. You really don't need it. 
the shanty is what you're wearing. You know, so it's a when you're looking at price comparison, yes, sir. Is that the blue suit? I mean, yes. Yeah, I, I wear the clam blue suit. So when we look out across the lake, you see all the Smurfs running around. That's us. Now, he has the gray suit. It's like one step above the blue suit. So he's a lot warmer as, as far as wearing less to be that warm. So the fleece that I'm wearing is a heavier fleece than what he needs to wear. So it's just a trade off. But his suit, just by your body, uh, by the activity that you're doing out there, he'll have to wear less to generate the same heat that I uh, have to generate to stay toasty. But so I do a lot of the hole drilling, you know, a lot more of that aggressive moving, and then, you know, he's, he's a little more, you know, laid back. But let me touch on how do we generate the heat. In the winter, eat a good big breakfast to start the day. Get that furnace <laughs> filled. <laughs> you got that furnace filled, you're going to be good. If you take two candy bars and think that's going to keep you generating heat, <laughs> no. So you can tell Warren, uh, I burn off a lot of it because of my metabolism, and we got to get Warren a little bit more active out there. But he loves to eat, which is a great thing. You know, there's supper clubs in the evening after spending a whole day out on the ice, and it's a good thing. But uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the power augers. Uh, we do have one on display. We weren't able to get it together, um, but there is a new product out there that's making your drill more like a power auger. And you guys want to check this out later. It's kind of heavy to pass around. It's basically a handle assembly with an industrial type bearing in it so that when you're running your drill, you're not going to have this thing torque your wrist. So basically, it takes your drill assembly and mounts it on this plate so that you actually have a trigger just like a power auger to operate that drill. And it has a flat plate that it sits on. I didn't even see that fall off. I didn't see it fall. Getting back to that red tape that was on my finger, <laughs> we were up in Miniman, and I walked past the quad, drilled a bunch of holes, and forgot to put that shroud back on the blade. And I just bumped that. And that thing sliced so deep and so fast that I, I just thought that I'd run into something on the quad. Well, that was, took a couple, three days for it to quit ripping open and bleeding all over. But be conscious, you cover those, they're super sharp. It's just like a boy knife or a razor blade. Uh, but getting back to the auger, as far as I'm concerned, I can't get enough power. I get nuts when I'm out there drilling. I'm that guy, when you're sitting on your bucket, you, you're thinking, is he ever going to stop? Is he ever going to quit <laughs> drilling? That's me. Um, I have a good story. Ron was out with us pre-fishing at Croton Dam in Michigan. So Ron and, and Warren, Ron is the owner of the uh, jig tail company. I said, I'll, I'll drill the holes. You guys start checking, find fish, let me know if you see fish, and then call me, I'll come back and we'll drill it out and see you know, how big is this pot of fish. So I fire up the auger and I go for an hour. I go across the whole basin from one shoreline all the way to the other shore. 600 yards. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of winded. Yeah. Take the jacket off, lay it down on the auger. Okay, that was, that was a lot of holes. I turn around, and Warren and Ron are like in the first two or three holes that I drilled. And I'm thinking, guys, you, the, the whole idea is to cover water, find the drops, find the pods, find cover, find anything. So I walk all the way back across. Now I left my jack in the auger at the other end because I'm, I'm getting upset as I'm going on. And they go, we got to cover water, guys. So I get up to them. I'm like, what's up? And they're like, well, we're on fish. And all those other holes, you really didn't need to drill them because we found them right here. <laughs> so we are going to bring two-way uh, walkie-talkies so they can tell me. Because you know, I did burn a lot of effort. But it, it, the point is that I don't want the apparatus that I have to drill or make holes slow me down. I don't use a hand auger unless I'm going to one of the forest preserve lakes and I pretty much know where I'm going to set up, go right to that area. Uh, sometimes like on Shadow, I know the exact cribs to hit certain times of the year. You don't need a big power auger to do it. But we'll show you in, in uh, some of the slides here why we need that power auger or more power to drill a lot of holes. Because every hole you drill is like a cast. And then how rare is it that you're out bass fishing going down a weed line that that first cast you make contact a four or five pound bass. Second cast you make, you catch another bass. Not every hole equates to fish caught. So you, when you're searching for an item or trying to find the cover or structure that you want to target, it does take several holes sometimes to have it dialed in. And I'm, I don't think I have it on here, but when I uh, fish out on Shabana, we do a lot of crib fishing. 
So the cribs are roughly a box 12 foot by 12 foot. Sometimes we have to drill a lot of holes right over it to figure out, are they on the sunny side of the crib, the shady side of the crib? So if you have a hand auger and you can only drill 20, 30 holes in a day because you get winded, that power auger is so much easier just to pull that trigger or the drill apparatus. You know, more holes is a good thing. Uh, this is an option that we had a couple seasons when we, I think it was the second season we fished, the ice gators. Uh, they increased the size of the batteries to get more holes. It seemed like the, north, the further north that we went, we weren't getting as many holes, so we were carrying around uh, the larger battery size. Uh, but we got away from that. It's a great tool locally. We don't get that two and three foot of ice. So this is an option, but the price break is about the same as a gas auger. And that's definitely the way to go. It has a reverse button. You got a forward and reverse. So if you get into trouble with your bit, you can back it right out. Um, there's a lot of torque to them. They do very well. And just for the volume of holes that we're gonna do, you know, one, two, I think the one year that we were doing it up in Minnesota, we actually got a third set of batteries and we had a generator trying to charge that first set after we ran it to zero. You know, you get 30, 40 holes, we want to move, you get another 30, 40 holes out of the second set of batteries, you know, now you're done for the day. And you got a five hour tournament, you need more holes. So it wasn't an option to keep yeah. going with. But locally, if you're gonna, if, if that's an option for you, you don't have fumes, you don't have gas smell, it's a very good product. It just didn't fit in with some of the northern lakes that we fish. Let's talk about the augers here. These are the Dills augers. We found those augers with sharpened blades one of the top augers. It's a very aggressive cut. You don't have to bear down on it to, to go through the ice. It pretty much pulls itself through. And we have a slide after this that show you various bits that we do have. But that's one of the better ones. The other thing is the batteries will point out in the uh, two, two uh, the, the 12 volt lower system, uh, it, was, it was two 9 amp hour batteries. Remember those little VEX batteries are seven amp hour. 9 amp hour, we found they can go as high as 10 amp hour. Those are what we look for now is amp hour there. When you go to the 12 amp hour, it's wider. So it usually can't fit in one and of those. And it's a lot more weight. So that's something to think about. You know, if you're carrying things on a sled or you're carrying it by hand, the larger the battery, the more weight you have. And you're kind of getting away from that mobility thing. But if you're throwing this onto a quad or throwing it into a sled behind a quad or snowmobile, that's not an issue. So the, these batteries are 20, 25, 30. You've now seen some of these Li-Ion batteries, 160, 180, 200. And it's just I'll, an option. We, you know, we just want to like touch on it so that you're aware of what's out there on the market. A uh, couple of the best ways to, to, to find that new information, there's uh, magazines that are out there. This is the Clam Annual that they kick out. Warren has, uh, I think there's the F and W. So they cover a lot of product we use in there. So without having to purchase and find out by trial and error, if you can read about what other guys are doing, uh, a lot of it is in Minnesota, so you have to take that into account. Here at the southern end of the ice belt, we don't have the extremes that they have, but you know we're still avid ice fishing people. So they give you some insight before you make that purchase. You know what are the good points? What are the bad points? Um, this is a smaller diameter bit. I have on a very light. Uh, Strike Master, that thing's probably 37 years old. It vibrates a lot. I don't like taking it out during the middle of the season, but early ice and last ice, this thing, it, it spins that bit so quick, I don't have to uh, bear down on it. And, and to do a trolling run, when I show you the, the pattern that we use for a trolling run, there's sometimes I'll drill a couple hundred holes in a trolling passage. Mm -hmm. That thing will slice through really, really quick. The only problem with the sm uh, smaller bit when you get up into northern Minnesota or Wisconsin, when the holes start to refreeze, you know, we bumped up to about a six to an eight inch bit. Sometimes you don't go back to those holes that you first drilled for say an hour. They start to get smaller and smaller. So we carry a much smaller ladle on our skimmer than the hole is because it, it will reduce. So if you start out with a smaller bit, once it reduces, it's very hard to get your jig back in there or an ice fish back out of that small diameter hole. So it's one of those things, we might drill a hundred holes but it'll be an hour before you get to those first ones that I drilled. They're reduced. They're not as large as they were when I first drilled them. So it's just another option to think of that we found in the tournament situation to be aware of. So we started with a larger hole, you know, inside of that hour or so we go back, there's still enough area to work that we can get nice fish back out of it. These are the bits that I was talking about. 
This is probably the main one that we use. It's called a 224. There's uh, four cutting surfaces plus that center uh, arrowhead to keep it centered in the hole. But it has some uh, eight inch and some four inch, I think, bits on it. So it's a very aggressive cutter. It doesn't take a lot of pressure from you or exertion from that motor to get that thing to fight through the ice. Uh, we're gonna go in an area where we have, I think in Michigan we found where a lot of sand was blowing up on the ice or we get somewhere where the permanent houses are at and guys are throwing out sand or ice, uh, salt or sand by the shanty so they don't fall down. Or if guys come off of the road and park their vehicle in an area, that chipper blade will reopen old holes and go through all those situations. You don't have to worry about dulling your bits. If you start drilling with uh, the lasers, that cup design does not fare well once you hit something on the ice. We have times where guys, you know, they do a soda can or a beer can and it's frozen in the ice. You hit one of those things with those blades, you're sending them off to Fran to have them sharpened or you're purchasing new blades. Uh, with this one, that chipper blade on that Strike Master, it, it'll go through that stuff. You might feel that little twinge and then you're through it. So it's a little bit more durable of a blade. So depending on what situation you're going to be dealing with, you can choose different bits to attach to your power head. Uh, this is another option that came out in 2011. A couple buddies of mine, within a week of each other, they had a problem with the fuel lines freezing up and then leaking propane. They corrected that. They already have a retro kit that comes off that propane all the way through the carburetor. So that's already uh, been addressed. But that's a really good auger. The only thing I like about that auger is the amount of slush and water that pulls up out of the hole and throws up on your, your shins. So if you're going to use this for trolling or, or you know, drilling a large amount of holes, you're going to get wet. So you just have to be aware of that. Uh, it has five surfaces. We actually have a set of smaller chipper blades, a large chipper blade, and then that arrowhead in the center to keep it centered in the hole actually has two surfaces to cut. Very aggressive cutting. Doesn't take a lot of pressure, you know, pushing down. Just the weight of the power head and the bit is enough to drive it through the ice. Uh, this is a trolling pass. So I first get out on the ice. I'll have my buddy fire up his depth finder. I'll go nuts. I'll start either in the deep water, go shallow, start shallow, go deep, and I'll just drill. And I'll go out, say, do 60, 80 holes. It's really not the number that's important. It's just that I want to make sure after I look at that map that I'm going to go across the area that we think the fish are in. And then he'll start behind me and start checking every hole to see if there are fish there. And you're definitely going to need a depth finder to do that. Uh, we have a simulator mode that I'll fire up on that hummingbird. The cat and mouse game that you're going to play once you find that the fish are there, if he hollers back and says, Jim, there's a ton of fish here, I go back to that same general area and then drill out another 20, 30 holes with fish. Unless we know it's a tree or a crib and you can contain the amount of holes that you need to effectively fish it. But on a forest reserve like this, it's either an outside edge of weeds, a pocket in the weeds, or an inside edge of the weeds. So once he finds that area, I'll go back and drill another 10, 12 holes or whatever we need to start pulling out the fish. Um, but again, that's that power auger. We might pick up a few fish from where he started to where he ended up, and then once you get over that school of fish, you'll just drill this area out with a few more holes for your buddy and everyone to get on fish. Uh, this is another situation where I made that trolling pass right down the edge. The inside edge was not where they were. They were actually on between shore where it wasn't inside edge. It wasn't deep in the weeds. But once you start seeing where everybody stops, it's real easy for me as the auger guy to turn around and say, well, where am I going to fish? I'm really going to be you know, right ahead of this guy or right on the other side of that guy because they identified where the actual fish are. It was on that inside edge before it went up towards the rocky shore. So being out in the weeds or being out in the main basin, they just weren't doing well. So it's real easy to see that pattern. So as a team, it's so much easier to do. You know, if you're going to be out there by yourself, that takes a lot of time to do that. But if you have four or five guys, one guy's the auger man, the next guy's vexing every hole or, or checking for fish. <coughs> Hopefully you guys in the back of the room can see this. This would be the bottom of the lake. I'm dropping my lure down. And if this was weeds, you start doing your jigging motion, the fish comes out, responds to what you're doing with your jig. And then right when they get real close, you stop staring at the display and just watch that spring bobber or that bite detector so that you know he's on. So whatever you're doing that brought him up, once you see that that's happening below you, key in on that strike indicator.
quit looking at the screen. And what happens a lot of times, you look at that screen and you're not doing anything here. And what you were doing to attract him, you stop doing. So then he comes up, looks at your lure, and fades away. You're like, gee, what, what, what happened? Wrong size, wrong color, sent on my hand. No. Most of the time, your attention goes to that display and you forget to do what it was you were doing to bring him in. If you want to take your eye off the screen, just start watching that line. And just keep doing that. Uh, one of the other techniques, if we know there's a certain depth that we need to be in, I'll start drilling in a straight line, and then Warren will give me a heads up. He's checking every hole behind me. We want to see 12 feet, so I'll start at six feet. I can start drilling until he tells me, oh, I come back and start going across that drop. Uh, the other technique, like on Delavan, there's really no rhyme or reason to where you're going to place your holes. You're looking for pockets or edges of weeds. So we'll just drill a random basketball court size uh, of random holes. And then he'll come back and tell me, either with a heel drag, or you kind of mound up the snow between your feet, something that you can look back across your field, which are good holes to fish in, or where we're going to fish. So just something that you have to work out with your team or your partner. Go back, everyone that had a heel drag, I saw fish. So then you go back and really pound it hard and, and see if you can pull a fish out of it. Uh, Warren will talk a little bit about electronics. Um, you know, what the different colors mean and, and stuff like that. Okay, what we, uh, you need to we found, we've owned all these uh, products and I'm a Markham man now. I got rid of all my Vexes up to last week and Jim loves this Hummingbird. So uh, really any of these is a very good product. Vexar came out with a 28 this year that is as good as anything. So, but for six hundred dollars, you got it. The, the side, uh, but but we find that they work. What we found uh, with the Aquaview last year, the team of the year, the Aquaview Micro. If you look in the 2014 guide, they published what he didn't want you to know. But this is how he won last year, <laughs> and it showed how he basically move that camera up at a 75 degree angle to see that the fish were up high. There were crappie, and they were up high. They didn't see them going down, but they saw them going up. Uh, we just happened to be on a lot of clear lakes last year. If you're in a dingy lake, camera's not going to help. But in clear lakes like Delavan and Geneva, uh, and the northern lakes in the chain, you, camera's going to work good. Uh, handheld GPS uh, is very important. What we do in the fall, I'll take my boat and we'll use the GPS. We can go six miles an hour to find uh, structure or mud flats. What we're looking for is cabbage with mud, not cabbage with sand. We find that there's bugs in the mud that somehow the fish relate to and, and those weeds they relate more to. Um, so if we want to go back to those, make sure you have a handheld uh, GPS. They've improved so drastically in the last couple of years. You're able to go back to that spot, be it first base, the home base, pitcher's mount, spot on spot, you're, you're there, not like it was years ago where you'd be in the infield. Where? <laughs> you're in the, what Warren's able to do is take the same unit he runs on the boat and we run it on his quad. So the same passes that we're making, we save all them trails and, and we save all the waypoints and we run side imaging and then when we run back out there on the ice, we're able to get back spot on spot, run that side imaging through an ice hole and then really dial these things in. So if you can get out there in the open water, it's a lot easier to do from a boat and capture your waypoints. What you wanna be able to do though is have that GPS so you can get back spot on spot. You don't wanna drill or have to drill you know, tons of holes to find that, you, you know, say, eight or 10, if you're getting back spot on spot. The less holes that you let everyone else see, uh, the better off you're gonna be. If you can walk right up to a spot, drill a hole, and you see there are fish there, you're kicking the source back in it and going on to another spot. You know that's a good spot for the tournament. Yeah, this side down, down image is we're able to mount it on a bucket and use it on the ice. So once we know where there's a cribs are, we can see uh, fish look like ghosts. We don't have to go drill it out until tournament day because what you find when you have 
150 guys, they're all looking for somebody lifting their arm up and then they're back over there checking. Everybody's checking it. So you're, you're trying to keep a couple spots safe so when you go out at tournament day to get, get good fish. The other thing is um, we created a, a row the last couple of years. A company out of Arizona created a little PVC row but using bilge pumps and a little propeller. So we mounted one of the new AquaView digital cameras on that and we're able to go down. What that's letting us do now is actually see the bottom contour like it is and see the if it is basically a remote control device that the camera's on. So you're actually like flying this thing below the ice. It's a submarine. We're an aqua view on it. So we can go out a hundred feet from the hole that was drilled to drop the apparatus in. And it was pretty cool on Delavin that technique of just drilling a bunch of holes and dropping on each hole or checking each hole to see where these fish at. As we were swimming around on the weeds, you can see that six or eight inch drop in the weed tops and that's where all the fish were. Now we still haven't tweaked out how to find the roll. Once we see that area, we can know a general direction to go, but we don't have exact distances from us. You know, it's just gonna take some tweaking, but it was cool to see that you would never notice that with the depth finder, a six, eight, or 12 inch drop. It's real hard to see on that depth finder as you're checking hole to hole. Because you're lifting and dropping out of the ice, so it can go from 10 to 12. You don't really you know, see that drop in the weeds. But when you're swimming that aqua view and you're going across, say, this whole room, that space between each one of those chairs is where the fish were, and you're able to see that. So it's information that you, you can gather with this thing. It's not that mobile, it's not uh, for everyone, but it is getting, you know, it, it scopes us when we're able to do that. Someone else can't see what we're seeing. So that's pretty good information. Then the other thing we're introducing this year is I picked up the 360. At ICAST this year, they announced one for the trolling motor. So it's $1,500, not $2,000. It's basically 27 inch poles with a five inch head. So we can use a six inch auger to get that down and get a picture. So I'll let you know next year how that works. <laughs> Yeah, the side imaging gives us distance, but what we're doing is we're manually spinning this thing on a bucket. Yeah. With that 360 scanner, it, it's like it's like a sonar uh, from a boat. That's the model. Okay. I'm just saying, you'll be able to see your fish and your model on a tool. We're hoping that it's faster than what we're doing manually. That's what we're really, time. And you don't want to waste a lot of time. And see 360 instead of, yeah, like you said, spin. This is uh, your flasher, basically. Yeah, the same thing we got on the simulator same, there. Sa same thing where this is the bottom, you might see a double thing. And what you're hoping for, uh, when, when, when we're going hole hopping, we're hoping to see some marks up. If we don't see a mark up, I still may drop to see if I can get one to come up. But uh, that's what you're looking for. And so then we're going across a basin and you were just have that display and there are three or four flickering red marks or orange marks where you're checking, you know, that's immediate. You want to drop a, a presentation down there right away to see what size and what are they. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to check 10 holes, maybe two or three hole fish. And again, that lens is over. We're drilling a lot of holes because not every hole is going to be hole to fish. Now the ma main thing with the, the VEX is you get a six foot and a 12 foot bottom lock. So you get a good view of the bottom. Markham does that too, but they give you a variable. So if you're on deeper lakes and you're fishing uh, suspended crappies, it's nice to blow up the area maybe 15 feet above the basin to 12, you know, 12 feet below the ice. And uh, that unit lets you do a zoom of a variable anywhere in the top. Is that the same thing on the hummingbird? Yeah. So the hummingbird. What he's saying is that you can eliminate, say you're in 15 feet of water, but you know the fish are between the last five feet, you know, between 10 and 15 feet. You can eliminate that first uh, zero to 10 feet on your view. So all you're looking at is from 10 to 15. So that window is a variable setting you can set on the unit and get past all that dead zone. You just want to see those fish are in this zone. 
I want to see if they're below my hole. But I'm, so, say, I'm saying it's in like a 40 foot basin because VEX is going to give you a 12 foot zoom. It will give you a six foot zoom. What it won't give you is, is if you're in a 40 foot basin, a zoom beyond 12 feet from the bottom. So, yeah, different units, they, you know, depending on what you're going to be doing. Uh, I wish I would have sat through the gentleman's seminar on Lake Geneva. You know, some of them depths of water that he's dealing with, you know, to find out what unit he's running to get good information from that depth. Yes. Is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, is, yeah. this, this is what you see if you're in weeds or cribs. So that's a nice feature that you can actually see fish. You know, the red flickers or the red marks that come in and out. The great thing about ice fishing is if, if it is alive, it's going to move below you. It's going to make that thing flicker. If you stay in the weeds in the same hole or on a crib or on a tree, everything that's solid isn't going to move. As soon as something appears, that's alive. It might not be the fish you're the kind of fish you're after, but it has to be alive because it swam into that cone. So all that other hard stuff, you're not worried about it changing lead because that's the same return. All of it's a constant return. So it's peeing into it and coming back. As soon as it changes and you see yellow and flickering red, that's fish. And what we're trying to do is catch the fish up here first. Kind of like a crappie school. Try to catch the one aggressive ones that'll come out. Once you've gotten all those, then you start going into the structure. Sometimes you lose jigs if you're in a crib and you gotta retie or send another rod down there. But you keep going because you get some nice fish out of there. You don't want to pull that fish from the middle of the school or the bottom of the school through the school. So a lot of times if they start swimming in a circle, that's going to put all the other fish in a negative state. There's two rings, red line, and then there's a thinner line, the white line. So what is the difference between the two? That zero to six on this end, that would be your blown up uh, scale. This, so on the this, this, this will show you that lure coming all the way from below the ice down to the weeds, where this is just showing you the last six feet of drop. Yeah, yeah this is how that shows your zoom. They, the zoom over here, and this is your normal water column. So when when, when you look on uh, th this side, of it. so it's getting more. It's, it's, it's more detailed information, a different you know, view of that information. Right, right. So you'll be dropping your jig, and that jig will start coming down on this side. And once it gets within six feet of the top of the weeds, you'll start to see it appear here yeah. and then come down. Yeah, and, and it's good. another way to see the size of fish, mm -hmm. because the marks that you see here. They're going to be pretty small in relation to a jig. So would you target the big red marks on the left side? No. Well, this is actually bottom. But if I saw this flicker okay. and turn red, yeah, that's, or, that, or, that's something I want to get. Or if that's with. your jig and you know these are where these guys are, can you get these guys to come up out of there? Yeah. So depending on the markum, the hummingbird, or the vex, whichever unit you're running, having that zoom is a pretty cool feature. Yeah. So they're like basin bite perch, same thing. When that school comes in, it just lights up the bottom. On this side here, you know, it might be a band like this. You're like, oh, that's a few fish. But when you look over here, and that band is two, three feet deep, because it's more detailed look at that same information, that's when the heart is just like, oh, yeah. Warren, what time that's is when, it? You know, that's, that's when the ice like, gets around your reel and you just shit them all. Oh, yeah, you get that, yeah, yeah. the bird nest. <laughs> But hopefully that doesn't happen to you, and that's when you're really feeling like, you know, I got it nailed. I finally, this is the day I'm going to come home with that bucket of fish. And this is some more uh, stuff on, on, on how to read it. But if you guys have more questions, we'll stick around. You guys can come up and, and, and ask us specific uh, questions on what we're doing. Uh, this is what Warren was talking about. We'll run that uh, side imaging or the depth finder over the cribs. Usually around Thanksgiving is our last trips out on the bodies of water. A lot of the, when we caught the big fish and won that death finder, a lot of the lakes up in Rhinelander, you had skim ice and, and conditions were just about to lock up solid. Where those fish are at that time is where they're gonna be at first ice. So we were able to identify schools with relating to drop offs or, you know, out of 12, 15 cribs down a shoreline, there might be three or four cribs that are overfished for whatever reason, be it a food source for them or the light that hits on it, what it we don't really need to know all of that. We just need to know out of the 10 or 12 cribs, which three are the high potential or you know, percentage spots to hit. 
So going out on the fall, we're able to do that and identify those high potential areas. Uh, and this is a real good map. Uh, we purchased from Electronic Guy Service. You're going up into Northwoods. This guy makes some really detailed maps. Once we were able to identify, say, this deep water or the two deeper pockets, if you can see those real deep blue or purple, those were where the fish were. Once we keyed in on that with a detailed map like that, and it's in the same plaza that we're running on the plot, you drive right to it. Now those basin areas might be the size of the parking lot in this building, but knowing that it exists, all the other area really wasn't holding the fish. They were down in that basin. So we knew where to go, where to drive to, and then drill out to find the fish. Yeah, af after day one of the uh, championship a couple years ago, the ice team members were one, two, three, four, and five. We learned the next day that that's where they were. So picture 100 people trying to fish that area. I've got pictures of that. And it wasn't fun to be in because you have these uh, rules and you can't get so close to we know, have a competitor. 15 feet away. And then you can be 100 feet away from your partner. So I drill one hole, I drill another hole for Warren, I go to drill another one, there's another team member, I can't drill there, so I go to step this way, there's another team there. I look back at him, I said, Warren, we got two holes to fish. Because everybody was so tightly packed, because of the rules, we couldn't really move. Yeah, they so, ended up uh, cleaning the fish out on day one, so you had to know about these areas. A or second these day flats. or a third spot that laid out similar to that. Control. And that's what broke up uh, Joe Pekulski and Myron from team of the year. Myron uh, let his son know a couple things, and his son beat and Joe by about an ounce. So the son and, beat and, the and, father and, and the team member. And was Joe was mad at his partner for sharing their information. <laughs> it's okay for his son to take third place, but not my first place. <laughs> the, the other thing about these maps, um, this is what's known as a, a depth map. With our color um, sonar recordings now, we have the ability to make softness maps. Let's just say this was a softness map where these orange and yellow are rock and sand, but then the blue is mud. Now you have the ability to find, if you found weeds and transition lines, you're able to then go right out to those things. So you don't have to you're, you're able to go six miles an hour, create this map in a couple hours, and then go back right out to those mud spots. So that's that's pretty good technology. Does somebody, <clears throat> does somebody make those maps? You can uh, generate them yourself. The problem with a lot of mapping software that's out there, once you belong to the cloud or the group, you're surrendering your information. They have the base maps. You give them the stuff that you found, they generate this great map, and then you can access it for free or a fee. The problem is that now everybody has information of that same stuff that you found. Okay. Now, go, he's go, got, back, go back to that slide. He's got some software that we're able to generate our own maps. It just takes a long time because the, the amount of passage you have to go across that lake to get all the different depth stratas and then compile it. You have to have some overlapping. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. EGFS is Electronic Guide Service. That's Brian Baker up in Rhinelander. He's got a whole bunch of guys on these lakes. He's probably got uh, 20 lakes now scanned. We use the same technology. I've been to Doc Sampson's mapping class, and he used a program called Dr. Depp. Dr. Depp was uh, per out of Sweden. The good news is one of the best companies we have near here is Johnson Outdoors. What do they make? They make the hummingbird, <laughs> they make the side unit, they make the 360, they make the Tarova trolling motor. It's a very good company. Mm -hmm. What I was doing last uh, December was trying to contact Per to see if there was an upgrade and his website was down. I sold my company and I can't talk. Well, about ICAST was announced that Johnson Outdoors bought <laughs> Per's product and what Hummingbirds, uh, what, what they did is they also bought Lake Master maps. What they're doing is they're taking that product into a mapping pro program, $199 for the base program, $249 for the pro, 
and it's not out yet, <laughs> but it, it should be out soon. But what that'll let you do is create these maps and then update your Lake Master card, and then you're also able to scan it for the hardness and softness uh, in that. You, you gotta remember when a Lake, Lake Master or Hummingbird or uh, Navionics makes a map, it's a grid. They're not gonna tell you if their runs are 50 meters apart, 100 feet apart, 50 feet apart. All you see, you don't, you don't see the interpolation they did. They may have 10% of that lake map dead on, another 30% close on, and no clue to the other. So what we're able to do now is if, if you're in your boat a lot, you might get an area where you fish and you go back and forth, you got a good idea what that is. We're now able to use the side scan and create uh, 3D maps of the, of the same thing now. So I expect that program should be out any day now, certainly by the, by the spring. And then that'll let you update your Lake Master maps. Is anyone running Lorance in Gen 1 or Gen 2? I mean, have you ever seen that on display and they have a, like a mapping on the go, and it's generating a 3D image of the information that's gathered by the unit. That's basically what he's talking about. That software that you can purchase, you can help generate maps for yourself by the information you gather. So if you've ever seen that on display, that's pretty cool technology. It, it, as you're going across the lake, you can have that set out 100 feet, and it's generating a map that looks just like that. I don't know enough about Lorenz if you can save it, and then kick out a paper copy of it, but it's pretty cool technology.